My name is Raja Kuduri. Uh, I work for AMD. Uh, I'm the senior vice president and chief architect of the Radeon Technology Group. The main set of things that I do uh, for the Radeon Technology Group and for AMD is uh, establish a vision and a strategy for where we are going with our graphics uh, roadmap for next three to five years. And also, as the owner of the business, uh, I also need to take care of the tactical issues of what we're doing over the next 12 months uh, as well, and ship products with good quality, good drivers, good marketing, all of those fall under my responsibility. And uh, in the silicon industry, uh, we have to have roadmaps four years out, five years out. Chips take very long to develop. So we need to have a plan four years out today already. And uh, so that takes some you know, vision, some foresight, and some just gamble <laughs> as well. I mean, fundamentally, everything we do is new. Uh, and when you're doing something new, there is always an element of risk in the sense that you actually don't really know uh, whether you're able to solve all the problems, right? We start off with setting some goals. Uh, saying, for example, we say, hey, in two years from now, we need to double our performance at the same power levels and at the same cost. Will the technology be available for us to do that? We go start talking to the foundries that make these complex chips, getting data from them, evaluating that, and in their projections, they have inaccuracies because they are projecting forward. Uh, they are guessing some, uh, some of their stuff. So there are elements of risk everywhere. And what we do is, as uh, senior leaders with uh, experience and expertise, we apply what I call our gut sense uh, to the data and say, you know, I've seen uh, 16 years of uh, GPUs, um, you know, I say, generation after generation after generation. So you develop a gut sense of what data you believe in, what bets you take, uh, and we apply that. So it's a combination of data and gut, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that we move forward. Now, there are some generations where we take incremental steps. Uh, those are very clear that, hey, I can achieve 15% performance increase next year, and I know how but I just got to do the work. And there are some things where we say I need to get to 2x in two years. I don't know how, but I'm going to get there. So where we are now with the GPUs and real-time rendering is that we are able to achieve very good interactive uh, frame rates for what I, I would call almost photorealistic, but not quite photo, photorealistic graphics. They're not the quality of the offline renderers yet in real time. So our pursuit has been to achieve that quality of real time rendering match the offline rendering. Almost close. It doesn't have to be exact, but if it get close, it will disrupt much of the movie making as it is done today. And we are seeing the use of game engines and GPUs in pre-production already, in virtual production already. I mean, there are some excellent examples uh, being demonstrated here at FMX uh, of uh, use of real-time rendering and GPUs and game engines in uh, pre-production. Uh, and we want to be able to get uh, the industry to use the same tools even for post-production. Fundamentally, we see VR as a very, very natural extension of things that we already do, right? Our, at our core, um, this is how I describe our vision as, right? That we are surrounded by billions of brilliant pixels. And with VR, we want those pixels really close to our eye, right? I mean, you know, the, we have driven big screens, small screens, and now you want those screens to be really next to your eye. And we generate those pixels. GPUs are the generators of those pixels, right? So it's a very natural extension of what we already do. So we love it. We love displays, whether they're close to your eye or you know they're in your pocket or they're on your desk 
wherever they are. So that's how we are looking at it. And as the display gets close to your eye, it also needs to be much higher resolution than the display that's on your desk or in your pocket because the distance between your eye and the display is much smaller. So the density of this displays for VR is going to go high. I have just stated uh, in my talk that uh, we'll be seeing 16K by 16K displays close to our eye in the next few years. So the amount of GPU horsepower you need to drive this uh, 16K by 16K displays is tremendous. And that's a great opportunity for us uh, as the GPU makers. I tell my engineers that with the immersive era that we are entering, that they have job security for several years because we have to produce GPUs that are 100 times faster, even a million times faster to achieve photorealism uh, with the current methods. So that's, you know, jobs for lifetime, even for a young engineer. We are seeing a tremendous amount of uh, excitement outside uh, media and entertainment uh, for uh, VR and AR. Uh, I mean, things like, you know, you, you mentioned automobiles, you mentioned uh, social interactions uh, and uh, uh, medicine. But the area that I am most excited about personally is education. I think it's going to transform fundamentally how uh, education is going to be in four or five years from now. The, the reason uh, is actually, for me, it's quite simple. I have uh, you know, two children I've uh, raised through the education system just recently. Kids these days, it's very, very hard um, uh, for them to maintain their attention on anything, okay? And the beauty of the immersive uh, displays and immersive experiences with VR is that they keep you, um, uh, you know, inside, inside that experience without distraction. They cut out the distraction. They cut out the external stimuli while you're experiencing it. This dawned on me, we produced recently uh, in collaboration with Smithsonian and a studio in LA, we produced the Wright Brothers first flight experience. And I've read about Wright Brothers, you know, several years ago, I know the kind of the, you know, the dates, the statistics and all, but when I experienced it for the first time, I was, it felt I was there, right? So there are all the little details of what they've done on the day, how they flew, how long they flew, is etched in my brain. You know, I, I don't remember many things as good as I used to <laughs> at a younger age, but it, uh, you know, the light bulb went off in my head that the learning is much, much more deep when you experience something in three dimensions like you're there. Imagine a chemistry lab, a virtual chemistry lab, where you have access to everything. You can mix and match anything. You can play with all the elements. You can, you know, cause some explosions and other things without hurting yourself, right? So that aspect, you know, both the play aspects in education and also just experiencing aspect in education are going to have a profound impact there. And the investments that go into education worldwide are tremendous too, right? There are billions of dollars spent today on education. So it's a huge market. So VR and immersive uh, era is going to have impact on all the fields, but the one I am personally uh, excited outside uh, gaming and uh, entertainment is education.